this is Tammy McClish. Let's take a look at section four, which is the x-ray beam. Now you're going to need to know some definitions. And these are units of output beam intensity. In 1981, the International Commission on Radiation Units and Measurements issued standard units based on SI or standard international that have since been adopted by all countries except the United States. It's kind of like when in the US we all um, were still using the um, customary system where across in Europe they were using the metric system. So when you're thinking about SI units and you're thinking about the international system, think about the metric system versus the standard system and that will help you. So the National Council on Radiation Protection and all U.S. scientific and medical societies adopted La Sistem International de Units, which is the International System or SI, and it was adopted by the early 1990s. So we're going to be taking a look at these units. Now, when you're remembering them, think about it this way. Exposure. Exposure is going to be your air kerma or your Rankin. Absorbed dose is your gray or your rad. Effective dose is your sievert or your rem. And radioactivity is your Bechlorel or your Curie. And you really don't need to know the Bechlorel and the Curie, but I put it on there because it's something that we talk about in radiology. So I thought it would be important to you to hear. Let's go ahead and start with exposure. exposure. We are looking at air kerma which is the kinetic energy released in matter. It is the kinetic energy transferred from photons to electrons during ionization and excitation. And remember, previously we talked about what happens when an incident X-ray photon comes in and strikes the X-ray tube target. And we talked about what happens to the electrons that are in the atoms of the X-ray tube target. So air kerma is measured in joules per kilogram, where one kilogram equals one gray. Anytime you think of air kerma, air kerma is the unit of radiation exposure. Now, if we're looking at the international system of units, it's the air kerma. But if we're looking at the customary unit, it is the Rankin, and that's how you say that term, Rankin. So this right here is a dosimeter, and this is used rather extensively in nuclear medicine. So what happens in nuclear medicine is when a nuclear medicine tech is going to draw up a dose of a radioactive agent to give to a patient for a study, what they're going to do is they're going to survey the area with this meter to make sure that there's no radioactivity. And then they're going to go ahead and they're going to draw up their dose and they're gonna put it in a protective hood and they're gonna to check to make sure that there's no radioactivity around their field where they were just working. Now, this is something that you're also going to see when um, the Ohio Department of Health comes in. They may be using this on the outside walls outside your x-ray room to make sure that radiation is not penetrating out into the hallways and things like that. So think of it this way, we're measuring the dose or the exposure of x-ray in air. That's a good way to remember that one. This one right here is our absorbed dose, and that is measured in the gray. A biological effects are, biological effects are usually are related to radiation absorbed dose or the rad. So when you see RAD, think of R for radiation, A for absorbed, D for dose. Absorbed dose is the radiation energy absorbed per unit mass and has units of joules per kilogram or gray with the T after it. Gray is the unit of radiation do dose or the rad, which is used to express the quantity of radiation absorbed by humans. The international system of units is the gray, and the customary unit is the rad, or the radiation absorbed dose. Now, I have some um, numbers here for you, 
and you don't need to know these, but I just thought it would be interesting. Now, I still use the term rad because I'm old. <laughs> so when I'm looking to see how much intensity an individual has received, I'm looking at rads or millirads. So 0 0.01 grays is one rad and one gray is 100 rads. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, let's say that I have a female patient and I find out that that female patient is pregnant. And then the radiologist is going to have to contact the um, physicist to find out how much radiation that pregnant patient received. That's how I like to think about it. So anytime I take an x-ray, I'm gonna look at my technique chart and I'm gonna write down the x-ray technique on a piece of paper so that when we find out later on that the pregnant patient received radiation, the physicists can determine how much radiation the patient received. Now, if a patient receives two millirad, that's like having a hand x-ray. And that's probably looking at 50 kVp, one milliamp per second. So that's not that much radiation at all. But if they have a CAT scan of their head, that's 100 millirads of radiation. But that is just to the head. That's not to the body, it's just to the head. So it's just good to get an idea of what these numbers actually mean. So a chest X-ray is gonna be about eight millirad. Three to eight millirad. Maybe three for the PA chest and eight for the lateral. So anytime you take an exposure, like if I did a three view of the hand, it would be two times two times, two, well, two plus two plus two. So the patient would receive six millirad with three views of the hand. Okay, the next one is the sievert. The sievert is effective dose. So the sievert is the unit of occupational dose. And it is known as the effective dose. Occupational radiation monitoring devices are analyzed in terms of sievert, which is used to express the quantity of radiation received by radiation workers and the population. The sievert also expresses a patient dose that accounts for partial dose of radiation. So the sievert is the unit of occupational radiation exposure at effective dose. The international system is the sievert, and the customary unit is the REM. The R in the REM means radiation, E is equivalent, and M is for man. So what this means to me, because I am in fluoroscopy, I have to wear a radiation badge. You only wear a radiation badge if you have the potential to receive a high dose of radiation. There's actually a way that you figure that out, but for all intents and purposes, if you're an x-ray tech, you need a radiation badge. Or if you're pregnant and you're a radiation worker, you should have a radiation badge. Now, when I walk over to take a look to see how much radiation I've received for the month, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at sieverts or REMs. So 10 millisieverts equals one REM and one Sievert equals 100 REMs. And I have to take a look at this report every year and I have to initial that I actually looked at my report. Now, we all cannot receive a dose annually as occupational workers greater than 50 millisieverts or five REM. I've never even come close to this. Um, now, I know that people that probably work in the cardiac cath lab, on, in the operating room, they're going to have dose on their badges. But for me, I really don't have any dose on my badge. Now I used to have dose when I worked in angiography, but I really don't have any anymore. So I don't worry about it. I still have to look at my report and sign it, but this is what an occupationally exposed person would receive. The other one I'm going to talk about is Becquerel, which is our radioactivity. Once again, you do not need to know this for your test. I just think that it's cool to understand it. So it is the unit of, of quantity of radioactive material, not the radiation emitted by that material. 
So Becquerel is the unit of radioactivity, and that is the international unit. And the customary unit is the Curie. And this is Madame Curie in this picture. But you do not need to know this for your GXMO test. Okay, so let's look at what we can control. We can control the quantity of the X-ray beam. Now think about it this way. Think about that I have 10 tennis balls in one basket and 20 tennis balls in the other basket. That's quantity. I'm increasing the quantity. So if I were to throw tennis balls at a patient, the more tennis balls I have, the more quantity of the radiation. That's a good way to look at it. So quantity is the intensity of the X-ray beam imaging system that is measured in milligray in air. Now we used to say milliroentgen, and that is called the X-ray quantity. So if I were to take an X-ray and I were to take a Geiger counter and put it in front of the beam, that's how I'm going to measure the quantity of the X-ray. X-ray beam quantity is the number of X-rays in the useful beam coming out of the X-ray tube. Now, there are key factors. Some of these you can control, some of these you can't control. Milliamps per second, kilovolt peak, distance, and filtration. Let's first take a look at MA and let's take a look at time. MA is your milliamps, time is going to be your milliseconds, and together it's called milliamps per second. Now, the quantity is directly proportional to the MAS. So if I am taking an X-ray and I am using 0.5 MAS, and then I go to 1 MAS, and I go to 2 MAS, every time I increase my MAS, I increase the quantity of the number of X-rays in the beam. It's kind of like if I had a half of a tennis ball, one tennis ball, two tennis balls. I'm throwing it at the patient. It's the same thing we're doing with an X-ray beam. So let's take a look at these pictures. So when I increase the MAS, excuse me, when I increase the MA, Let's say that I'm going from 100 MA to 200 MA. I'm going to have more electrons coming off of my X-ray tube filament that are gonna strike my X-ray tube target that are gonna give me photons of X radiation. The X-ray will be darker. It's gonna also affect the density. So in the first picture you're seeing in the middle, think of that as 100 MA versus 200 MA. As I increase my milliamps, I'm asking for more electrons coming off of my X-ray tube filament to strike the anode and give me photons of X radiation. Now, if I take into, into effect the milliseconds also, and I'm making my exposures longer, if my exposures are longer, I'm going to have a darker X-ray film. If my exposures are longer, then I'm going to go from 0.5 MAS to 1 MAS to 2 MAS. But basically, in my heart of hearts, when I think of the effect of quantity, I think of MA only. I don't think of milliamps per second. I mean, I could, but um, I like to think of MA because I have more electrons coming off my X-ray filament. But the longer I expose my patient, the darker the image. Okay, here's another factor that affects the quantity of the beam, and that is KVP, or kilovolt peak. The quantity is going to be proportional to the KVP squared. So, 
if I increase my KVP, if I go from 55 KVP to 65 KVP, I'm going to have a darker image. If I go from 65 to 75, I'm going to have a darker image. And that's called density. If I go from 55 KVP to 65 KVP, I'm going to increase my KVP, which will decrease my overall contrast. Increasing KVP decreases contrast. Low contrast is going to be gray. High contrast is going to be real black and white. So if you're taking a look at 55 KVP versus 75 KVP, 55 KVP is going to be real black and white. 75 KVP is going to have lots of grays. To be very honest with you, I only change my KVP if I'm going from one body part to the other. So if I'm x-raying extremities, I might pick 50 to 65 KVP. Maybe I'll pick 55 and not change it. Where if I x-ray the spine, I can go from 70 to maybe 90 KVP. <coughs> but to be very honest with you, I pick one KVP and stay with it. I'm not a KVP person because look at this picture. As I change KVP, I'm going to change my contrast. As I change KVP, I'm going to change density. And that's just way too much going on in my head. I tend to change my milliamps per second for all of my exposures. I leave KVP alone. So if I'm told to use 55 KVP on a hand x-ray, that's what I do. If I'm told to use 80 KVP in a spine, that's what I do. I don't change my KVP on a body part. I leave it the same. But for all intensive purposes, quantity is proportional to the KVP squared. Okay, now distance. You should not be changing your distance. If I'm going to shoot a hand x-ray, I'm going to shoot it at 40 inches. If I'm going to shoot a chest x-ray, I'm going to shoot it at 72 inches leave it alone. But quantity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the x-ray tube source. And that is called the inverse square law. Now, there's actually a mathematical representation. You're not going to have to do that on the test. But just know that doubling the distance decreases the intensity by one fourth. So what I did was I took a foot x-ray at 40 inches and then I dropped the x-ray tube down by half. And as you can see, the image looks darker. But what it's doing is whenever I change my distance, quantity is inversely proportional to the distance from the source. Now filtration is something that you're also not going to change unless you put a filter on your machine. Adding filtration to the useful beam reduces patient dose because fewer low energy x-rays are in the useful beam and it's going to decrease the quantity of your x-ray. But you're really not going to be doing this. So I wouldn't worry about it, but it's just something that I have to talk to you about. Okay, let's take a look at the quality of the beam. As the energy of an x-ray beam is increased, the penetrability is also increased. The penetrability of an x-ray beam is called the x-ray quality. Anytime you think quality, think penetration. X-rays with high penetrability are termed high quality X-rays and X-rays with low penetrability are termed low quality X-rays. And the key factors affecting them are KVP, half value layer and filtration. The only thing you're ever going to have to worry about is going to be KVP. 
for quality or penetration, okay? So KVP is kilofold peak. Increasing KVP increases the quality of an X-ray beam. Now I told you before, I like to leave KVP alone unless I have to penetrate something. So in the first hip X-ray, you can see that you can see the bone, you can see the um, the artificial hip that's been placed inside of the patient. But I had a doctor that wanted to see the mechanism itself. So in order for him to see that mechanism, I went from 70 kVp to 80 kVp. Because what does that do? Increases the kVp is going to increase the penetration of the beam. And that's what I did. Other than that, I leave kVp alone. Half value layer. You're not going to have to do this. But when your physicist comes in, they do this. They have these little slips that they put in between the beam. But you're not going to have to do that. So HVL is half value layer. And it, is a me it measures the quality of x-rays. Now these are little slips of lead. The half value layer is an x-ray of an x the half value layer of an x-ray beam is the thickness of absorbing material necessary to reduce the x-ray intensity to half of the original value. And that is going to range from three to five millimeters of aluminum or three to six centimeters of soft tissue. So when a physicist comes in, you can maybe go watch them and they may be doing this. I, when I perform mammography, they did this all the time. But what they do is they take an exposure and they're like, oh, let's see how I can decrease that by half. And they start putting these little things of aluminum in there. And then they figure out how many they put in there. And that's a half value layer of the machine. You will not be doing this. And filtration. Filtration. Increasing filtration increases the quality of an x-ray beam. You're also not going to be doing this but it's something that you just need to know the definition. All right, well, that is it for this section. Have a good day.